welcome. Woo! <laughs> um, just a couple quick announcements. Um, for your viewing pleasure, we're going to have a movie tonight. Um, it's a pre-release of Cormac McCarthy's City, Child of God, not City of God, and it's going to be in Gaylor Hall, which is kind of our administrative uh, office, but they have an auditorium on the lower level. It's um, a big building right near the McClurg Dining Hall, and there's a white sign outside that says Sewanee Writers Conference. Um, so that's at 9.30 tonight. One other thing to do uh, by tonight is to initial your departure info, which is back there on that shelf, and it's got everyone's flights and the bus that you'll be on. So if you're flying home, definitely initial it by tonight, because you'll either be on the 5.30 a.m. bus on Sunday or the 8.30 a.m. bus. Um, we just want to make sure that everyone's on board. Um, if your name's highlighted, just talk to Adam or Megan about the details. And now it's my pleasure to, oh. I'm going to pass the hat. Oh. So this is going to go around for a tip for the wait staff. Mm -hmm. So when you see this go around, there'll be another chance tonight if you don't have cash on you. But. Awesome. Thanks, Thomas. All right. And now, please welcome Dan O'Brien. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dan O'Brien. This is Lena Patel, who is... Uh, brave enough or unfortunate enough to read with me. Um, it's a, it's going to be, it's the first act of, of a play called The Body of an American. And I, I read from it a scene last year and then I read the whole act about three years ago. So I'm having a lot of guilt that at least some people may have heard it before. Uh, I won't be offended if you get up and leave right now. If you leave halfway through, I'll be offended. Um, I should also warn you the play has, uh, the play's it's about a, a war photographer, war reporter, a combat journalist that I've been working with for about five or six years now um, that has also turned into a book of poems, which I'm not feeling brave enough to read from, but here it is. If you <laughs> I think they're sold out at the bookstore, so thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that anemic applause. <laughs> um, no, but thank you. And uh, so I've been working with him for a few years. You'll see in the play what he's well known for. He won the Pulitzer Prize for um, taking that picture of, a, of a, a U.S. Army Ranger in the streets of Mogadishu. It was being desecrated in the streets of Mogadishu in 1993. Um, let me back up and just say thank you to Wyatt, to, to uh, Megan, to Adam, uh, to everyone that I get to teach with and meet um, now four years in a row to be teaching with Daisy. Daisy's, Daisy Foote is an amazing uh, playwright to teach with. I feel like we have a great system. I'm the overly chatty cop and she's the smart cop and I think we uh, do a decent job. Um, Great, so what else do you need to do? The play is two actors playing 30 characters. So it'll be a little bit crazy. Um, we'll be doing some voices and some accents. We're trying to. <laughs> um, it's part of what's crazy about the play in terms of the structure and the style is that it's meant to be inspired by and to sort of evoke uh, this journalist's life, well now, fairly lifelong struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's not just me trying to be, to be kooky. Um, but just so that's clear, it's two actors, but they're going to play many different characters. Uh, great. I seem to be missing my first page. <laughs> I'll share yours. So it's the body of an American. Uh, scene one, fresh air. My name's Paul Watson. I'm Paul Watson. This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. Remember that famous 1993 photo? I was a reporter who happened to... Dear Mr. Watson, I don't usually email strangers like this. This is Fresh Air. I'm, I was leaving Princeton. New Jersey? Where I had this fellowship. You had a what? A residency. Which means you do what? Well, I was supposed to write a play. A play? Yes. About what? Ghosts. Ghosts? Yeah, ghosts. What kind of ghosts? Historical ghosts. And they pay you for this? Sort of, definitely. Uh, I'm really grateful to them. Is it scary? My play? I don't know. I hope so. To me it was. This is fresh air. I'm Terry Gross. Let's start with a description of that now famous Pulitzer Prize winning photo. I was a reporter who happened to carry a camera, a 35 millimeter Nikon I bought because my editors wouldn't buy me one. We were on the roof of the Sahafi, where the journalists were staying. If they were staying. You could count on one hand who was still there. I'd have to count on one hand, because my other hand... Isn't really a hand at all. I was born this way. A bunch of us were drinking beer. Did you see that light? What light? 
uh, behind that chopper there just went down behind that hill. Chaos ensues. A 16-hour battle raged through the night between U.S. Army Rangers, Special Ops, Delta Force, and Somali militias. It started as an arrest operation trying to abduct commanders in Mohammed Idid's militia. They were trying to track down Idid and arrest him for allegedly organizing attacks on UN peacekeepers. When I woke up on the hotel floor, still dressed, hungover, 18 American soldiers had been killed and 75 wounded. Clouds of smoke billowing up from burning tire barricades, dead bodies in the street. American troops were trying to get the rest of their force back alive, and in so doing, they killed more than 600 Somalis so far. Including women and children huddled in the darkness as bullets or shrapnel pierced the tin walls of their shacks. Kutali's my translator. He hurries through the gate. They are shooting everything that moves now, even donkeys. He gets $30 a day. My driver and bodyguard get 100 That's always been the hardest part of my job, convincing good people who get none of a byline's ego boost to risk their lives because I've decided a story's worth dying for. They're shooting people on sight, even people with no weapons. Mogadishu was beautiful once, white painted Italian at villas in the capital of the most stable state in Africa. Now you see women grocery shopping with militias firing machine guns up and down the avenue. Children playing on front lines, running water and bullets beside their mothers to keep the gunmen supplied. They shot down a Black Hawk. They are taking a soldier with them from street to street, perhaps alive, perhaps dead. They threw him in the back seat of the car. A Toyota Cressida that nobody outside the safe zone would recognize. They made me hide my face between Kutali and my bodyguard Muhammad. With another Muhammad driving and a gunman in front cradling an AK-47. We drove through the gates and crawled from street to street, passing the corpse collectors, men carrying bodies by their hands and feet, glaring at us through the filthy windshield. Has anyone seen a captured American soldier? Some said. They've seen him. He says he's alive, tied up in a wheelbarrow. A wheelbarrow? Uh, no, this man says he's dead. He's most definitely dead. I took a few pictures of some kids bouncing up and down on a rotor blade in the smoldering tail section of that downed Black Hawk. Have you seen the American soldier? The entire crowd pointed. This way. Each time a Black Hawk thundered past, people would shake their fists and curse at it. We drove all over the city for two hours and were about to give up. When the driver makes a U-turn. He sees something. A mob of 200 Somalis moving down an alleyway. What is it? This is bad. Too dangerous. Go slowly. What's he saying? He's a coward. He's worried about his car. This guy's going to get us killed. Shut up. Gutali gets out. Game is in the car. You know Game. Game is local slang for cripple. Little man. No hand. He's not American. He's Canadian. You know Game. He just wants to take some pictures. Can he? The crowd parts around me. I look down at the street. And I meet Staff Sergeant William David Cleveland. Take the picture quickly. I've taken pictures of corpses before, many of them much more fucked up than this man. Hurry, Paul. I bend over, shoulders stiff. Take it now. With a camera in front of your eye, you cover your face and you focus only on the good shot. You shut everything else out. Everything goes quiet. Despite the noise of the crowd and the helicopters. Everything goes completely silent. And I hear a voice, both in my head and out. If you do this, I will own you forever. I'm sorry, but I have to. If you do this, I will own you. I've sought psychiatric treatment in subsequent years, and my psychiatrist says it's my super ego. I believe it was William David Cleveland speaking to me. And what did he mean? Well, Terry, I took it as a warning. A warning of what exactly? I have to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to desecrate your body. If you do this, I will own you forever. I took his picture. While they were beating his body and cheering, some spitting. Some kid wearing a chopper crewman's goggles shoves his way into the frame. His face is all screwed up in rapturous glee while giving the dead man the finger. An old man's raising his cane like a club and thudding it down against the dead flesh. The wind's blowing dirt and the stench is making me gag. For weeks I'd hated UN peacekeepers like this man who killed from the sky with impunity. But now it was us against them. Get in the car, Gamay. The men holding the ropes that bind the soldier's wrists are stretching his arms out over his head. They're rolling his body back and forth in the hammering morning light. I feel like I'm standing beside myself. I feel like I'm somebody else watching myself take these photographs. Somebody named Paul doing this crazy thing. Shooting pictures. Asking, did I put the batteries in? Click. The bullet wounds are in his legs. Did they shoot him in the street or did, did he die before he crashed? Click. His body's so limp, he must have just died. Click. Maybe he's still alive. Is that why I can hear his voice? If you do this, click, click. I will own you. Click, 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 click. You poor man, who are you? We must go. Let's go. They don't want us here anymore. The car door is shut. Soft idling of the engine, the muffled mob. It's like I've stepped out of Mogadishu into... A wobbling canoe years ago in Sudan. Drifting downriver at dusk with... Andrew Staviki. A Polish emigre photographer who snaps a picture of boys running naked like a snake along the river's blood-red spine. That's going to be a great picture. They won't print it. Why not? The kid's dick was showing. In my mind's eye, I see Sergeant Cleveland's army-issued green underwear, the only clothing left on his body. The underwear is slightly askew, so you can just make out a piece of the dead man's scrotum. 
Open the door. Open it. This time, I framed it better. The body from the waist up. A woman slapping with a flattened can. That boy with the goggles shoveling his face through the mob. Laughing at us. Men with bloodshot eyes notice me. It would be like squashing a cockroach to kill me, this infidel who can't take a hint. Look, he's leaving now, see? We're leaving for good, thank you. The squeak of the hotel gate always let me breathe easier, as if a few sleepy guards could actually keep us safe from everything happening out there. I take the service stairs two at a time to my room, stuff the roll of film between the mattress and box springs, switch on the broken AC. I collapse on my bed with my eyes closed and I cry for a very long time. This is fresh air. The AP printed it, and so did Time magazine. That's right. Uh, AP moved the half-body shots, which appeared in newspapers all over the world. What Time magazine did, which I find fascinating, is they digitally altered the underwear so you can't see any genitals. But you do see horrific desecration of an American soldier. This picture had incredible impact. Yes, Terry, that's right. Because immediately the heat was on President Clinton to do something, and that something was to announce the immediate withdrawal of American troops. Then when it became time to decide whether or not the United United States should lead an intervention in Rwanda, where 800,000 people were killed in a hundred days, President Clinton decided not to use the word genocide so we wouldn't be forced to intervene. And we know without a doubt Al-Qaeda was there in Mogadishu. It says so on indictments in U.S. federal court. Bin Laden's bragged about it. His minions have bragged about it. Uh, but what disturbs me the most is that Al-Qaeda learned a lot from the propaganda impact of that photograph. 18 American soldiers were killed that day, which is nothing compared to what used to happen on a bad day in Vietnam, and it's only relatively bad to compare to what's still happening these days in Iraq or Afghanistan. I think it's safe to say, take all of the events that happened, but remove the photograph, and Al-Qaeda would not have chased us out of Somalia. Bin Laden would not have been able to say to his followers, look, we're able to, to do this. We only need small victories to defeat history's greatest military. After my photograph, 9-11 and this never-ending war on terror. My guest today has been journalist Paul Watson. His new memoir about reporting from war zones is called Where War Lives. We'll talk more after a break. I was listening. Sorry, scene two. Sorry. <laughs> Who was he talking to? I was listening to this podcast, writing my play about historical ghosts, packing up all our things. It was the very end of August. It was the end of New York for us. It was the end of something else. What? our youth in Princeton, which is just so beautiful this time of year. Every time of year, really. All the trees and leaves, all the squirrels, all of the privileged children, including myself in some ways. I was sad to leave. It had been a rough few years. I'd walk around the campus late at night and feel almost good about myself, smart, of value. And of course, I felt guilty, too, to have had this library, these trees and squirrels, the beautiful young women to watch, Unlimited laser printing. <laughs> While you're off in Iraq, Paul, or Kabul, or Jakarta, that's where you live, Paul, right? And Jakarta's in Indonesia, right? There was this hangar-sized Whole Foods nearby. Lots of Priuses and bumper stickers celebrating the date when Bush would leave office. I'd go running in thunderstorms sometimes. I'd sit on the back porch sipping vodka, cooking meat on a charcoal grill, watching swallows swoop out of a twilight sky into my maple tree. And your voice got to me. It's your voice. I tend to be solitary. This is you speaking, though it might as well be me. I like to stay home with my wife and son. Dinner parties? I tend to stay away. I've spent enough time around people who do what I do, and in my opinion, and I include myself foremost in this group, we're a bunch of misfits. People who are seeking self-esteem through risk. I felt you could have been talking about playwrights without any real risk. You were mad. I'm sick of being lied to, and I take it as a challenge to make sure nobody's lying to me. I felt like I knew you, or I was you in some alternate reality. Men start wars because it helps them to make sure that women aren't laughing at them. You were funny. I feel much more comfortable with the weak than I do the powerful growing up in this condition. We should talk about that, your hand. Should we? Why not? It's helped me out a lot. In Kosovo, on food lines, they think I was a wounded war vet and give me all kinds of free shit. And as I'm packing and listening to you, I'm wondering if I feel so moved because you sound so messed up. If something's risky and we probably shouldn't do it, I'll say, don't worry about me. I'm already dead. Or because you scare me. The haunted often sound like ghosts, in my experience. I just have this sense that I've already lived much longer than I should have. You poor man. Who are you? Scene three, Q&A or got to go. 
I have no idea who my father was. He was a soldier, right? I gotta go. Take care. Paul. I just wanted to say thanks for writing me back. I got your email on my wife's Blackberry halfway across the country at this tumbleweed rest stop on an Indian reservation somewhere outside Tulsa. Dear Dan, I just got back from Kabul where I found out it's easy to buy stolen U.S. military flash drives at an Afghan bazaar outside Bagram Air Base. And these flash drives are full of classified information. So security numbers of soldiers, maps of Taliban and Al-Qaeda targets in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. Wow. Sorry, what were we talking about? Your dad. Uh, stormed the beach at Normandy. Uh, died a few days shy of my second birthday. And you were born when? 1959. How old are you, Dan? I'm younger than you. I could be your nephew or a younger brother, maybe. My father didn't die in the war, though. Of course not. How did he? He had polycystic kidney disease, or, or PKD. Which is what? Um, like it sounds. Cysts start growing all over your kidneys and until eventually you die. Will I have it, too. Will it kill you? No, I've got pills for it. So what you mean when you say you don't know who your dad was is you don't remember him? Do you? Do I remember my dad? Do you know who he is? What do you mean? What did you think I meant? He was around. I mean, my father was always around every day. He never spoke to us. If he did, well, then it was just to tell you how fucking stupid you were. Is he dead? I don't know. You don't know? Wait, why are you asking me questions? I've got to get back to Kabul. I'll email you. I'm staying in this condo in a renovated schoolhouse. Sometimes I hear ghostly children laughing. This gland in my neck is swollen and aches. I'm Googling the symptoms. Let's Skype or Facebook. Are you on Facebook? I don't know why, but I'd rather keep emailing like this. I, I don't know why, but it's almost like a conversation. Yeah, but it's not a Yeah, but it's almost. Are you in L.A.? I'm in Madison, Wisconsin. What? Why? Teaching. And writing about ghosts? Sure, still. Is it snowing there? It hasn't stopped snowing since I touched down in January. Cars are abandoned in the middle of highways. I don't leave the condo much. I'm home in Jakarta, in case you're wondering. There's a thunderstorm and my little boy's asleep. He's always asking me, how long will you be gone, Dad? He's seven, so he doesn't understand time just yet. A few weeks back, we were lying in bed together, and he asked me, when you're dead, will you still be watching me? Where were we? We were talking about fathers. Uh, so then Ray enlist enlisted at 17. You call him Ray? Yeah, faked his eye test. He was... Tall, splendid physique. That's what someone wrote about him in one of his files. It said, Ray is... Frank, pleasant manner, decisive style of thinking. There's one story I know. There's only one story I know for sure. They were taking a medieval city in France. Twisted streets, churches, and houses made of stone. My father takes a bullet in his thigh. Watches one of his soldiers trapped in the long grass. Ray can't do a thing, but watch his friend die. Each time this man cries out for help, a Nazi sniper shoots him till he's dead. How do you know this? Research, my mother told me. Yes, good. What's she like? Well, she's the strongest woman I know. Okay, fine. What else? When they were sitting together on a streetcar. A manhole cover's popped and he's gone. She gets off the next stop and walks home and sits down on the front step and waits for him. Sounds like PTSD. I gotta cut this one short. Can we talk about your hand again? My hand? You know, your lack of a hand. I'll be in Sulu in the Philippines. Outside my window, a freight train rolls past every night. Its bell tolls over and over again. Seven civilians have been killed by Philippine troops, including two children. As the snow piles higher on Lake Monona, bearing the Obama sign stuck in the ice. Yes, we can. Reading glasses. Check. Sensible shoes. Check. Spring break. Hey, Dan, you were asking about my hand. It doesn't bother me much. My mother used to always tell me nobody's perfect. How did it get that way? The kids would cry out around me at recess, and the bravest ones would reach out and touch my stump. How'd it get that way, Paul, huh? Huh? This was when I remember first thinking, this is not me. This, that body belongs to somebody else. The day I was born, I had these nubbins instead of fingers. And the doctor just snipped them off. The hands attached to a wrist that bends with a palm no bigger than an infant's. Did your mom take a thamil thamilamide? Uh, everyone thinks that, but no, she didn't. It's a mystery. Something in the DNA. Is that why you're like this? Like what? Oh, I don't know, a, a war reporter? iPod, check. Satellite phone, check. Laptop, check. Endless tangles of cable, check. Two people have been murdered near where I'm staying. Some pars of Detol disinfectant soap for microbes. A man my age, a girl on different days. Check. Both were stabbed repeatedly in the middle of the day at home. I go out running on the icy roads past their stained faces on telephone poles, just like I used to jog past the makeshift morgue outside Bellevue that recent September. I'm sorry, Dan. I've been gone so long. I was in Christchurch on vacation. Where were we? Your perfect childhood. Yes, my street was Princess Margaret Boulevard. My school was Princess Margaret Public School. Who's Princess Margaret again? We had a milkman, mailman, paper boy. How many siblings did you have? Five. You? Six. Wow, you really are Irish. Nothing bad happened in your childhood? Other than your absent father and your absent hand that never bothered you? My brother Jim liked to take my father's old Luger out of hiding. Sometimes he'd let me hold it, and I'd imagine myself as the man who'd once held his finger on that trigger. You mean your father? No, 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 the Nazi. Then my brother would put the pistol back in the dead man's closet. Did you have friends? You sound lonely. You sound kind of like this really lonely kid. I was in a band. 
called Eruption. I was the manager of the band because of my hand. We did a shitload of drugs. Purple Microdot, California Sunshine. Well, what's that, acid? My best friend Richard and I listening to Dark Side of the Moon in the middle of this circle. We'd burnt into a field of grass behind my house, high as two kites. Richard turned me on to Camus. We'd chew peyote before gym class. And get off on the psychedelic rainbows trailing behind high jumpers and kids doing flips off balance beams. Oh, I remember one thing that was somewhat disturbing. Our friend Andy blew his brains out at his parents' summer cottage. Just some what disturbing? It was hardly surprising. He was stuck outside himself. Were you, Paul? I hung out with his dealer. He must have been 30. At a motel, he pulls out a bottle and a baggie full of pills. Up or down, my choice. I washed down a few with a belt of whiskey. You took some heavy downers, man. Who cares? That's the trouble with chicks, right? Right! Hells yeah! An hour later, he's carving his arm with his knife. Bitches always want perfection. And he's slinging my body over his back like I'm some medevac soldier on TV in Vietnam, dumping me in a cab. He's my little bro, man. He can't hold his drink. Stop the car. Puking through the chain link of a construction site as the taxi spits gravel. You were fucked up, Paul. Maybe you were depressed. Maybe you were low on some brain chemical like serotonin, dopamine, whatever. And this kind of crazy behavior was your way of feeling normal. I was also having fun, Dan. Didn't you have fun in high school? Sorry, I've got to go teach. My students are trying to learn how to write with conflict and stakes and something remotely real. I had this one teacher I loved. That's an inside joke. Uh, I had this one teacher I loved. He took us all on a field trip once. There we were floating in a canoe in Algonquin Provincial Park under a canopy of stars with my classmate Stephen Harper, future prime minister, no shit, behind me paddling, thinking, who could not love Albert Camus? And that's how I ended up winning the Pulitzer. Wait, what? I don't get it. I gotta go. This time it's an emergency. Emergency. Turn on your TV and you'll see. I've got to say, Paul, I can't help feeling you're not being entirely honest with me here. I mean, I don't mean that you're lying, per se, but everything has this kind of Hemingway patina to it. This kind of old-school journalistic swagger. It's like you're trying to impress me. I got into Burma on a tourist visa. With the Tribune execs measuring the column inches we produced, not getting into Burma to cover the cyclone devastation would have been career suicide. Hiding by day in the hull of a riverboat in the Irrawaddy Delta, among the hundreds of corpses bobbing at dusk in the sea-soaked paddies is the body of a child. In pajama bottoms with teddy bear cartoons on it, the bleached skin's like rotting rattan, the leg bones are green, the stench is unbearable, but the people on shore don't seem to notice. My fixer explains that Buddhists believe the body is nothing more than an empty vessel, and the soul has already been reborn as someone new. After several stiff drinks that night, I lay on the roof of our boat staring up at the universe. Listening to Laura Bush give forth with earnest pleas to the hunter on Voice of America. And I imagined myself as nothing more than a passenger on this rotting vessel of my body. And it felt good. I felt free. That freight train's approaching fast, its headlamps swallowing the churning snow, the chiming bell, the shrieking horn. Dear Dan, I've been meaning to say you sound kind of depressed. Don't let that get a hold of you. Trust me. Maybe you should uh, talk to someone besides me. <laughs> or take a pill. Has it stopped snowing yet? No. Nope. Medication, calculated, estimated time away, multiply by seven pills a day for depression, blood pressure, PKD, toss an extra in case I get kidnapped, check. Where are you going this time, Paul? A few chocolate bars, 85% cocoa for the dose of flavonoids the TV doctor says will give me an extra 3.5 years and fight heart plaque. Where are you now? My son is sleeping. It's the rainy season here again. And lightning's lighting up his face like a strobe. I lean in close to his ear and whisper, Don't be afraid. I'll come back home soon. Do not be afraid. Japanese green tea for the antioxidants, corkscrew for the cheap Bordeaux I'll purchase en route at duty free. I've got some more questions for you, Paul. More antioxidants and some liquid courage to help ease the pain of this five-star hotel room blues. Scene four, the ghosts are getting closer. But I'm whining. Okay, let's get back now to the story. You win the Pulitzer Prize. I was in Rwanda when I heard the news. As everybody's aware now, 300 Tutsis an hour were being beaten to death with these large wooden clubs with bent nails and heavy spikes sticking out of them. Real prehistoric shit. Homemade machetes. Just a few thousand UN soldiers with air support could have washed all those maggots away. We were getting high on the bridge over Rasuma Falls. We is not the royal we. We is someone I don't want you to meet just yet. Kareen and I watching refugees spill over the border to Tanzania, watching corpses spill over the waterfall down into this brown whirlpool smashing against the rocks. In a house we found children piled like sandbags on a bed. There's a baby down at the bottom. Its tiny hand is bloated, its severed head cracked open like a coconut. Did the other children try to hide him in here? Outside the door I slipped on a bunch of school books. 
One book had been covered neatly with a color publicity shot of the Dynasty TV show cast with John Forsythe's fucking grinning face. The ghosts are getting closer. In Gahini, a 16-year-old named Francois Sampundu sat on the grimy brown foam of his hospital bed. He says Hutus hacked up his mother and siblings. He says he hid beneath the kitchen sink for a week beside his family's rotting corpses. Francois Sampundu was speaking so calmly. He says, by then, if someone had come to kill me, I wouldn't have cared much. At a church near Nayara Bouye, we pushed open a gate on a court yard like Auschwitz, like Sarajevo. They'd come here hoping God would protect them somehow, but it only made things that much easier to get butchered. In Zaire, a girl stands at the roadside, rows of buzzing corpses. At a Rwandan refugee camp. She's looking for the toilet. Which was a field where a hundred thousand people would shit and piss and die. This girl stumbles barefoot into a ditch of bodies, some rolled up in reed mats. She's looking everywhere and now she begins to cry. As if hoping somebody will help her. But nobody's coming. I thought to myself, this would make a beautiful picture. This is a beautiful picture somehow. I raised my camera, stepped backwards to frame her with more corpses, and I stepped on a dead old woman's arm. It snaps like a stick. Then a few days later, I'm at Columbia's, Columbia University's Low Memorial Library in, a, in, in this room, like the uh, Parthenon and the Pantheon combined, cornucopias of hors d'oeuvres on apron banquet tables, wearing tight shoes and a navy blazer, wool slacks picked out this morning at Brooks Brothers, John Hondrick, my boss at the store. Watson, you don't look so hot. I guess I just feel bad about that soldier's family. Have you thought about finding his wife or his mother, hunting them down? Had I? Had I? Kevin Carter, who just last month was snorting Ritalin off the floor of my apartment before rocketing off into the townships. Wins for feature photography. A vulture waiting for a Sudanese girl to die. Always a popular category. Carter comes back to the table. Hear that? Applause, Watson. I kicked your ass. Two months later, I'm back in Rwanda. Hondrick calls me on my satellite phone. Carter killed himself last night, parked his pickup truck in Johannesburg, duct taped a garden hose to the tailpipe, left a suicide note. That I'll paraphrase. I have been haunted, so now I'll haunt you. Paul? Paul? I don't care about him. Who cares? I don't care! With so many people suffering all over the world who want nothing more than to live? That man is a coward. If you can't do your job, then get out of the way so someone else can. Of course I've wanted to kill myself before. But the truth is I've always lacked the courage. So I tell myself. Just go someplace dangerous. Let somebody else kill you. Scene five, shrinking. Okay, so you are 35 years old. You are male. You're a reporter for the Toronto Star, and you s you're stationed here in Johannesburg. You're a very thorough reader. I simply prefer to begin with who you are. Why don't you have a couch? Is that chair not comfortable? It's easier to complain lying down. Have you come here to complain? Are you going to answer every question with a question? Would you care for a drink? How about a double scotch? I'm afraid I'm all out of scotch. How about water, Paul? May I call you Paul? May I call you something besides Dr. Grinker? It sounds kind of Nazi. Dr. Grinker is my name. Are you shaking? Am I? Your face is pale. You have sweat all over your face. Let me catch my breath. Okay. Uh, another question for you, doctor. Why the troll doll on your desk? It was a gift from a girl who eventually got better. She said I've never been to a psychiatrist before. And what are you scared will happen to you? That I'll lose my edge. What does that mean, your edge? Being crazy. You think I could cure you of that? Being somewhat crazy is a job requirement. So you're afraid if you talk to me and you feel better, your career will suffer? I'd be happy, which means I'd have to quit. You called me, Paul. If you leave, I won't charge you anything. You wouldn't be the first to change his mind about therapy. But you filled out this card here whereby I see you've been feeling numb and paranoid. That's not a psychiatric uh, disorder. I don't think people deserve to be trusted. You're irritable. Small things will make you cry. You experience explosions of anger. Interestingly, you deny nightmares. No psychiatric history prior to this. Congenitally deformed arm. Don't smoke. Self-medicating with lots of alcohol, marijuana. Look, all I want from you is some feel-good pills to patch me up. Okay? Okay. We can find you something, I'm sure. Thank you. But first, you'll need to talk to me. Medication targets symptoms. We will need to target your soul also. <laughs> you find that humorous? You're sitting in an Eames chair. <laughs> You're writing in a clipboard. Okay, so my life looks too normal. Why can't you make eye contact with me? Why is it so dark in here? Why don't you open these blinds? You're right, Paul. It is dark in here. There are too many books on these shelves. I don't like it either, you know. I'm renting this place. And you're right to think I'm lucky. 
But when I was fresh out of medical school, I was shipped off to the secret war in Angola. Why is he telling me this? Why do people always tell me these things? So I do know something of where you've been. But this was years later when I, when I visited him writing my memoir, and I was having trouble remembering details. I can't remember when it was exactly. He told me... And then one day the phone call came through. Larry, your liver transplant is ready. Come down to the hospital now. There was this sense of tranquility about it. Because of what? God? You don't have to talk about God or whatever. The reality is I was saved. Purely by luck? Perhaps. But as a consequence, I have this belief that, hey, I've been given a second chance. And I must use this chance very wisely and to the best of my ability. Why do people always tell me these things? Why can't you view all the very horrid things you've witnessed this way, Paul? Why don't you feel fortunate simply to be alive? The ghosts are getting closer. Here, drink some water. Would you like to lie down? If you do this, I will own you forever. Tell me about your father, Paul. No, we've been over this already. We've only just met. I, I've read self-help books, Freud. What was your mother like? <laughs> you find that funny too? She's the strongest woman I know. And have you known many women? One. You've known only one woman? I've been in a relationship with one woman uh, on and off. Kareen. Kareen? <laughs> What a name. Tell me, what's this Kareen like? Uh, she loves Rococo art, homemade noodles, and beer for dinner. <laughs> Sounds nice. Her father is his German bureau chief, and one time she was sitting on his lap in front of me, smiling with her bare arm up around his, his neck like, like this. She's the one <laughs> who needs some therapy, don't you think? She flashed her tits at me once down this long hallway in her father's condo. I don't know why I feel the need to keep talking about her father. Uh, she's blonde, great body, sexy voice, calls me Polly. She doesn't let me uh, have sex with her, though. We, sh we share a house, but I pay the rent. I live in a closet-sized room off the kitchen. I'm happiest on her leash, so to speak. I like to sit with her when she takes a bath or lying in bed with candles lit, drinking wine or smoking a joint while she gets herself off beneath the covers. It's not sex, she says. It's only for comfort, Polly. She likes to tell me that. One time she let this guy into our yard to watch through the window while she fucked this other guy. She told me this at breakfast in great detail. She wants to be a war reporter, so we went to Rwanda where we met this handsome aid worker named Laurent who was building latrines for refugees. And there I was with my camera in my one hand shooting pictures. By that evening, she was lying in his cot under his netting, writing in her diary. He got a hotel room in, in our hotel with grenades exploding in the shanties and the death squad spreading through the streets. I call downstairs and she answers laughing. Holly? We have to go. Not now, Laurent. We're killing people outside. Get off me, please, Laurent. He's living with us here in Johannesburg. They fight and then fuck all the time. How long have you been hating yourself so ruthlessly? Why do you feel you're despicable, disgusting, worthless? Why do you think you can win your mother's love with the Pulitzer Prize? Why are you and all of your siblings still unmarried? Why can't you simply accept you were born with a congenitally deformed arm? Paul. Why don't we stop for the afternoon? Have a tissue. Focus on your breathing. I'm going to write you a prescription for 450 milligrams of moclobemide per day. Is that good? No, that is bad. You're clinically depressed and you have post-traumatic stress disorder. It's good that you've come. Do you have someone at home, besides that sick woman, of course? These drugs will take some time to change your brain chemistry, and we don't want you killing yourself in the meanwhile. There's a chemist across the street. It's easier if you slip out the back door. You go well. You'd always say that to me when our time had run out. You go well, Paul. Cheerio. What are they like? What? Your plays, Dan. I don't know. Historical, like I said. I prefer things in books. Why? I like things that have already happened to other people a long time ago. Victorian travel literature, also Henry James, and William, the whole James family. Well, why? I have some ideas, but... Like what? Well, the truth is I'm insecure around you, Paul. You intimidate me terribly. You're like this mythic figure with your hand, your constant returning to the underworld of the most nauseating things in history, recent history. You've looked at that which the rest of us won't look at or can't look at. You're the type of writer I've always wished I were, engaged with life, people. You don't engage much with people? No. I like to seclude myself. Like you, I like to stay away. Sometimes I lay my head against my dog's head and I think, you're my best you're friend. You're my only friend. If you get sick, I'll get a second mortgage for you. Even though we don't have a first mortgage yet. We're just renters. I even like my obsessions, but I don't know why I do. Like I said, I have my theories, but I think they'd be boring to someone like you. Try me. 
I'm like you, like I said. I have post-traumatic stress disorder, in a way, though I've yet to see a corpse. Like you, I'll sometimes cry for no reason at all, or I don't cry for months and months and months. Like you, I see flashbacks. I'm scared to change that part of me that's craziest, because if I'm not crazy anymore, how will I know what, what, how will I do what I do? I'm the same age you were in Mogadishu, the same age Sergeant Cleveland was that day. I'm cursed, too, just like you are. But you won't tell me what's cursing you? Because it can't compare to what you've been That's through. That's so strange, because I'm jealous of you. To have never seen a dead body, to have never witnessed evil, if only I could say goodbye to, to the paycheck, the pension, the prestige, and retreat from the world and write something truthful about myself for myself, that would take some real courage. But that's something I'll never do. Why can't you? Good morning, doctor. How have you been this week, Paul? When I wake up, my hands are fists with my nails digging into my palm. Sometimes I find scratch marks I on my face. I can't remember whole f months of my life. It's like I'm squinting through an incredibly dirty window. Yet when I close my eyes, I see certain dead bodies I've known with the clarity of a photograph. That baby's bloated hands sticking out of the pile on the bed in Rwanda. How did I get here? Who was I there with? Kareem? Some days I stay in bed till dinner. Then drink, and, and then I drink and fall back asleep. You will have to be patient with these drugs, Paul. You would have to stop drinking. Can you stop drinking? I don't feel different. They don't work like that. They have to build up in your brain. You've only been coming here two months. Do you believe in ghosts? I think people are haunted. What if I told you I came to you in the first place because I'm haunted? Cursed. I'd ask you some questions to rule out schizophrenia. I told him about the picture. It's famous. It's yours. Then I told him what Cleveland's voice told me. If you do this... I'll own you forever. That was your superego. Your mind was simply speaking to itself. I know what my own mind sounds like. This, this was someone else. The soldier. I, f I felt him next to me, feared his presence. Is he here with us right now? He is. He's here when I wake up. He's here while I'm sleeping. He's, he's with me whenever I'm happy, when I'm having fun or sex or watching TV, as if he's saying, this cannot last. And of course, he's with me whenever things go wrong. He's happiest when I'm in pain. He'll never go away till he gets what he wants from me. And what does he want from you, Paul? Scene six, Iraq. This was in Mosul in northern Iraq at the beginning of the war. A boy was throwing some pebbles at a Marine Humvee whose 50 caliber machine gun was whipping and twisting like a fire hose, spraying death. And as I'm taking pictures, a gang of students come rushing by with another student bleeding from a deep gash in his face. Somebody makes that sound, you know, like click, like take his picture. And while I'm switching lenses, you can see the, the switch go on in somebody's head like, he's white. What the hell's he doing here? <laughs> I'm lifted off the ground, tossed around, I'm stoned. Somebody slides his knife in my back and I'm feeling the blood pooling in my shirt. I'm holding onto my camera while they're stretching out my arms like this till I'm floating on top of the mob. And I'm not trying to be cinematic here, but it was like, it was like Christ on the cross because I had absolutely no sense of wanting to live or fighting back, protesting my innocence, crying out for mercy. I had this sense of, well, uh, we knew this was coming and here it is. But the truth of these places is always the same. A dozen people, a dozen against a multitude formed a circle around me and we were close to this row of shops that were closing and these people simply pulled the shutters up and shoved me under. That's when I realized my camera's gone, the, the hand's empty, the mob is pounding on metal, the tea shop owner says, look, you know, I'd really like to help you out, but would, would you mind leaving my tea shop soon? So I end up in the street again, kneeling in the dirt at the order of some pissed off Marines, and somehow I convince them to take me back behind the wire. That's why I know it's not just my brain, doctor, or my, my father dying when I was two, or this hand. It would be poetic justice to get ripped apart by a mob. Remember what Cleveland said to me, if you do this, I will own you. I just have this feeling, he's thinking, you watched my desecration, now here comes yours. Scene seven, some embarrassing things or the plan. Dear Paul, it's been a while, apologies. I finally escaped from the Wisconsin winter and I'm back in my strange new home, LA. 
I've just filled my prescription for Zoloft, and even though I'm still drinking too much, with my, which my psychiatrist says is bad for my liver in general, but also with these pills, I think it's starting to help some, and I'm hoping you still want to write this play or whatever it is with me. I know it's been a very long time since I first reached out to you. Maybe sometime I could give you a call? I have to go to the Philippines where Abu Sayyaf, the local Al-Qaeda affiliate, is on the march once again. I'm worried my editor, who hates me for reasons I, I can't even pretend to comprehend, won't like it. It's not the sort of story that tends to garner those coveted clicks on the Times website. It's 75 degrees here and sunny. Women's faces are slick masks thanks to Botox. Some men look embalmed in tan also. I walk my dog four times a day. The only helicopters I see here are LAPD circling over Brentwood like they're still looking for OJ's white Bronco. While I'm running up Amalfi to sunset, the Palisades look more like the hills of South Korea on MASH or Tuscany. Where are you now, Paul? What's your cell number? Can I call you? Can I come visit you in Jakarta soon? I thought you might enjoy hearing this soundbite directly from the fetid mouth of our paper's new owner, Sam Zell. Here's the link, http uh, gawker.com slash 5002815 slash exclusive. Sam Zell says fuck you to his journalists. My attitude on journalism is simple. I want to make enough money so I can afford you. And while it's true I like a gutter-talking billionaire as much as the next guy, I do wonder what he's up to, especially after publish publishing a new employee manual telling us all to question authority and push back. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you're giving me the classic what I call journalistic arrogance of deciding that puppies don't count. With all the chaos building at the gates in Afghanistan and Iraq, he's just the sort of leader I'm not willing to die for. Hopefully we'll get to the point where our revenue is so significant we'll be able to do both puppies and Iraq, okay? Fuck you! So if ghostly voices ever figure into this script, maybe this clip will make a good one. Don't you think it's strange you've never heard my voice, Paul? I've heard yours on all all Things Considered, the LA Times website. Let's set this trip up now. I want a grant to come visit you. Hey, congrats on the grant. I've got a rusted RV in Bali. We can watch the surf and drink and discuss genocide. Only problem is I finally got fired and my RV just got crushed by a tree. But have no fear, I've got some ideas. My wife's an actress on a TV show that flopped. We're not sad about it at all, but everyone thinks we should be. It's winter, but it's sunny and warm. Every season here is the same, sunny and warm. I, I have trouble remembering what season it is without thinking. The days get shorter or longer, but the sun stays the same. I go out running on the beach at dusk. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I'm going to move back home to Canada, where the plan is I'll work for the Toronto Star again, covering the Arctic Aboriginal beat, shooting pictures, writing stories, blogging about life in the midnight sun or the noontime moon. In any case, I've been waking up thankful each morning. I won't have to write another sentence about Al-Qaeda ever again, unless Bin Laden's found in an ice cave somewhere. You have no clue, Paul, how happy this makes me. You have no idea how much the ice and snow and wind speaks to me, so much more than the sun of LA or Bali. When I mentioned Victorian travel literature was my thing, I meant 19th century polar treks, mainly trapped in the pack ice for months, sometimes years. Scurvy, insanity, cannibalism. This helps me relax and fall asleep. Maybe I could visit you there this winter, and who knows, maybe the Arctic could turn into the second act of our play, because I have this deadline coming up. What kind of deadline? It's mine, and it's soon. The end of winter. So when will you give me your goddamn phone number so I can plan this trip? Why won't you tell me something true, Dan? What do you mean? Give me a story. Something that makes you feel embarrassed. Just like I've been embarrassed by all of this. You've been embarrassed? I'll try to change the subject. I've already shared a lot. You only speak in these mock, whimsical, ironic asides. You talk about fellowships and grants and running all the time. Like a very insecure young man. It's true, I've never heard your voice. I have no idea who you really are. Why do you need to? Why? You don't need to know anything about me. The whole point of me writing about you was to write about you. After my memoir came out, I'd hear from complete strangers who tell me the most intimate things about themselves. Embarrassing. About their lives. They saw that just like them, I had these internal conflicts. Except you. You didn't confess anything, which is probably why I wrote you back. Do you know that uh, quote of Camus where he says he solved the mystery of where war lives? It lives in each of us, he said, in the loneliness and humiliation we all feel. If we can solve that conflict within ourselves, then we'll be able to rid the world of war. Maybe. So tell me, Dan, where does war live in you? My family stopped talking to me several years ago, and I have no idea why. That's not true. I have many ideas, but none of them make any sense. I was getting married, but it wasn't like they didn't approve of my wife. 
It had something to do with the fact that nobody would be coming from my family because they have no friends. I mean, literally, my parents don't have any friends. They can barely leave the house, and whatever's left of their own families won't speak to them for reasons I've never understood. And I'd just written a play that was the closest I'd come to writing autobiography. And my brother was in the hospital again for God knows what exactly, depression mostly. He hadn't spoken to any of us in years, which was mostly okay with me, because like everyone else in my family, I suppose, I just wanted to forget he'd ever existed at all. Maybe this was all because of him, reminding my family of what happened years ago when I was 12 and he was 17, one Tuesday afternoon in February, walking up the driveway when I noticed him coming around the house with his back all pressed with snow, the back of his head white with snow, and I thought it was so funny he wasn't wearing a jacket or shoes. He was barefoot. And by funny, I mean disturbing. I, I've told this story thousands of times. I hardly feel a thing. He jumped out of a window, was what I found out later, and fallen three stories without breaking a bone. That night, my mother cried in my arms and said, this is a secret we will take to our graves. I developed innumerable compulsions, including counting, hand washing, scrupulosity, which is the fear that one has been sinful in word or deed or thought. I was afraid to leave the house to touch any surface, but I hid it so well that nobody noticed. I was class president. I played baseball, soccer. I wrote secret poetry. And eventually I got out and went to college. And things went coasting along as well as things can in a family with an inexplicably cruel father and a masochistic mother who can't stop talking about nothing. Logoria is the clinical term, I think. Until I came home one weekend for a visit just before my wedding and my father said I looked homeless. My beard and hair. When in fact I looked just like other adjunct professors of writing. <laughs> but they told me I looked like a man who'd slit his own throat soon. They said I looked just like my father's brother, a man who disappeared after I was born. He was tall, he was funny, long hair and barefoot in jeans, a hippie and some kind of artist. The opposite of my father. I'm the spitting image of this man, they said. They were terrified for this reason. There are things you don't know, my father kept saying without saying what it was exactly I didn't know. My mother and father were both screaming together. It felt almost sexual. There are things you don't know. I drove away and haven't heard from them since. They are dead to me, and I don't mean that in a, the way it sounds, melodramatically. I mean, I can't remember them. And by memory, I mean I can't feel. I have no pictures of my childhood. It's like my entire life up until I was 33 happened to someone else. Someone who's haunting me, who makes me feel cursed. Makes me feel certain that, yes, they're right, I failed. Something is wrong with me. I don't know what it is, but yes, something is wrong. I failed, I failed, I failed, I failed. Only vodka or running helps. Therapy doesn't help. Zoloft hasn't helped yet. I sit at my desk like a lab rat clicking on a button that shows me who's visiting my website. And it doesn't tell me who's visiting exactly, but it shows your city or town on a map of the entire world. When I said they don't talk to me, that wasn't true. I can tell my mother checks my website at least once a day, sometimes twice. It's a compulsion, I know, but still I like seeing those dots on the map. But it's nothing. It's nothing to complain about. It's the sort of thing everybody has, and nothing compared to the unspeakable acts of cruelty you've seen, Paul. Let's get together somewhere in the upper Arctic. In 24-hour darkness this winter, the hotels there are like dorms for racist construction crews from the south, and the costs are on high because everything's flown in, but the ambiance will be just perfect. <laughs> so let me know when you'd like to come, and I'll put together some kind of a plan. End of act. Thank you.